It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christine Mallinson. She's a professor of language, literacy, and culture at UMBC. Her interdisciplinary research examines the intersections of language and culture, focusing on English language diversity in the United States. She is the author and editor of three books, among other publications, and has created a free app for teachers called Valuable Voices. She also is the author of BaltimoreLanguage.com, a multimedia site about linguistic diversity in the city. And I personally have already fallen in love with her because she's very sympathetic to my New England accent and has uh, made me feel right at home. And so here she is to present on the social life of speech. Good morning. I want to take you back to a very clear memory that I have in my mind from when I was about four years old. And I was watching Sesame Street, and I heard the one word that would change my life forever. And that word was coffee. <laughs> And the reason that I picked up on this word was when I was watching Sesame Street, I heard somebody say it like this, coffee. And I was growing up in North Carolina, and when I was growing up, I heard the word pronounced more like this, coffee. And then I thought about my dad, who is from Pennsylvania, who says the word like this, coffee. And my grandparents, who were immigrants from Germany, who said the word, coffee. And so that really got me thinking as a kid. It wasn't just that words can have different pronunciations, but as I would learn later, that the way that we use language can vary along social lines, along lines of age and where you come from and the language that you speak originally at birth and gender and culture and ethnicity. So I decided to get my PhD in this stuff. <laughs> That's me at my kindergarten graduation. And I knew at that point that I wanted to study something about language. I knew that I was fascinated by this question. I didn't yet know the term sociolinguist, which is the term that I use now to describe what I do. But I did know that I wanted to study the social life of speech. So when it comes to the social life of speech, I think nobody says it better than the great Toni Morrison, who says, we die, that may be the meaning of life, but we do language, that may be the measure of our lives. So what does it mean to do language? Well, we do language in all sorts of different ways. We do it differently all day. We do language according to who we are as human beings. And we use language in, according to our social context in ways that, that express who we are as people. We do language with our families, perhaps our first and most influential site of learning how to do language. We do language with our friends and our colleagues. And very importantly for our purposes, we do language at school. This is particularly relevant in situations where the culture of the teacher and the culture of the students and their linguistic backgrounds are not always the same. And this is the issue that I have dedicated the past decade of my research to, which is exploring how can we help teachers support culturally and linguistically diverse students. These are real questions that teachers have asked us. They know that these questions are paramount and important in their classrooms. So teachers are asking us things like, my students tend to write how they speak. How can I help them? And how can I help empower students' voices and help them retain who they are? And how do I deal with tricky situations such as if I tell them to use proper English, what happens when they take the, the very implicit statement that's right there under the surface that suggests that the way that they use language is improper somehow? These are excellent questions and it is so good that teachers are asking these questions and looking for the answers because we know from the research in linguistics and education that when teachers are not aware of these issues that there can be damaging consequences. So we know that all of us, all listeners, hold implicit biases about the way that other people talk. And this is not endemic to teachers, but it is very important for teachers. When we prefer listeners who sound like ourselves and can hold bias against uh, uh, speakers and can hold bias against speakers who sound different from ourselves. In the classroom, this can have difficult and challenging 
situations. So we might have a situation where there are miscommunications between teacher and student, or where there are difficult interactions, or disputes over who is listening or who is showing respect. This is a big contributor for achievement gaps, so-called achievement gaps, otherwise known as opportunity gaps, for students who are underrepresented in, higher edu in, in education, including higher education, particularly students of color. So we see how language directly can lead to behaviors like withdrawal, silence, lower performance in school on the part of students and on the part of teachers, it can lead to lower expectations and the miscommunications that I mentioned earlier. If students believe that their language and culture is valued, then they know that they are valued and they are more likely to value school. But the converse is also true. So it is incumbent upon us in educational settings to make sure that we're sending the message that students and their entire backgrounds are valued and that they belong. So we take a strengths-based perspective in our work that really emphasizes the fact that linguistic diversity is a resource, not a deficit. It is something that students bring to the table that reflects the diversity and the cultural vibrancy of our communities. And when I say we, this is my co-author, um, Ann Charity Hudley, who's, who's now at UC Santa Barbara, and together we have worked with teachers for over a decade, hundreds of teachers, to develop strategies to help them implement culturally and linguistically support supportive and sustaining techniques in their classrooms. We have, these are uh, some pictures of some of the teachers that we have worked with, including these teachers right here who are from Baltimore. And we've written two books for educators that are written for a more general audience that really present this material in ways that they can understand. So we've come up with three types of strategies for how we can communicate this information to teachers. One is how can we get all students to value who they are and what they bring to the table linguistically. The second is how can we marshal that as a resource to help them learn the standardized English that everyone needs to know to be able to succeed. No one here would be in this room if we didn't know standardized English or master the, the, the linguistic codes that are used at school. But we need to use students' resources as a bridge to get there. And then third, we want to help all students, even students who might consider themselves just plain speakers or you know that they don't have any linguistic diversity themselves. We want all, all students to understand and respect and value linguistic diversity. So I can't cover all the amazing things that some of the teachers that we've worked with have been doing, but I can give you some highlights and show you the, the impact on their students. We've got teachers who have been using um, uh, our techniques to teach advanced vocabulary terms to their middle school students right here in Baltimore. Words like witty and optimistic by helping them focus on telling a story of who they are. And uh, this technique of a culture words box where students bring in words from their own culture and communities and then they discuss them as a class and that's their linguistic warm up for the day and they use it in their writing prompts. As this teacher put it, we can't take away students' language because that's who they are. We've also got techniques where, where uh, teachers are using the information we bring them to help their students become language investigators. So they investigate, as you can see on these charts, the way that these students speak in their own communities in Baltimore, and the students love this activity. Nothing gets them going more than you telling the teacher how it is that you speak in your community and at home. The students are doing the, these uh, basically analyses of grammatical patterns and pronunciations, and then they're using that as a way to compare it and contrast it to standard English, and they're getting a richer sense of their own wide linguistic repertoires, as well as how to succeed in school. We also have teachers who are using this, as you might well imagine, when studying great works of literature. Students can apply information about how language varies to the study of reading books like uh, To Kill a Mockingbird and Their Eyes Were Watching God and so many works of great literature that have language variation in them. And students and, and teachers, it's very important to have the skills to be able to talk about um, what patterns it is that they're seeing on the page. We also have students who are, teachers who are using this in uh, areas where they're doing a historical analysis. So this teacher, a fourth grade teacher, had her students taking a look at, oh, actually I think this was more like a, a first grade teacher, having their students look at this book and that was set in the 19th century and come up with what they called 19th century settler English. So this was a way for them to get into the novel with sort of a different entrance point that they might otherwise have had. And she said it led to a growing appreciation and greater respect for the ways that people speak differently among her students. 
As uh, Dean LaCour has mentioned, we have an app for that. We have created an app that has uh, very um, robust strategies that teachers can use all or part of in the classroom to figure out, you know, the, the pressing question for teachers is, yes, but what can I do in class tomorrow? So this app answers that question. You can go on, download it, take a look, and try to use it in your own classrooms. And then, of course, if you do, please tell us how it went. Um, we also are doing some of this work right here in Baltimore. I have this blog called BaltimoreLanguage.com that's been um, picked up in the media. There was a great um, a whole series on language in Baltimore that was done by the Baltimore, Baltimore Sun last year, and that has actually been picked up in schools right here in Baltimore where kids are, again, becoming language investigators and studying their own language. We've also done this right here at UMBC. Some of my amazing students who are right there in the background helped create this video called uh, Voices of UMBC, which has already been, been viewed thousands of times, that talks about how our own linguistic diversity is a resource right here among our student body. The entire film was student run, student created, and, and with students who were interviewed. I wanna leave you with this parting thought, which is that I see as our mission for educators in K through 12 settings and in higher education is to give the students the tools that they need to, to succeed on the tests that we give them and that we require of them while sustaining, while empowering their diverse voices so that we can support the next William Faulkner, the next Zora Neale Hurston, the next Martin Luther King Jr., Toni Morrison, Juno Diaz, Flannery O'Connor, so that we can have all our students with all their diverse voices right here in the front row of our classes at UMBC. Thank you. Thank you.